Welcome to Windsor Teachers Ancient History. Today we're going to be discussing the ousting of Superbus and the sometimes clunky and chaotic transition from monarchy into the fledgling Roman Republic. Firstly, let's get some global context for this change from monarchy into republic for the Romans by looking at other things that are going on around the globe at the time. Around about this time, uh, the rule of Superbus, Cambyses II comes to the throne in Persia. Cambyses is best known for the Battle of Pelusium in 525 BC, in which he decides to use the Egyptians' belief against them and supposedly has his soldiers wear armour made up of cats, which to the Egyptians are sacred animals. Also, he makes friends with the desert Arabs, which allow him to take over Egypt with greater ease. And finally, Cambyses is also famous for his treatment of the Apis bull. After returning from a disastrous Ethiopian campaign for which he supposedly did not plan anything, he returns to uh, the city of Memphis, who are celebrating a religious festival. He takes this religious festival as a slight and slashes at the Apis bull, which the Egyptians believed was the embodiment of the sky god Ptah. After that comes Darius the Great, the third Achaemenid king. He is well known for his various different building projects. Darius, not being a direct descendant from Cambyses, has to borrow legitimacy, and he does so by lavish building projects that lend legitimacy to his name, despite not being a distinct relative of Cambyses II upon his succession. So he builds and develops the, the city of Susa, and he begins building the city of Persepolis, he finishes off Pasargadae, and supposedly repairs lots of monuments in and around Egypt as well. He's also famous for the Darius Canal, which was actually started by an earlier Egyptian pharaoh, but for which Darius claims all the credit. He's also known for building the royal roads, which gave rise to the Persians' pride and joy, the breakneck uh, speed postal service, which is able to travel around the vast Achaemenid Persian Empire at great speed. While this is all going on, we have Superbus coming to the throne at 534 BC, and so his reign interlaps with that of Cambyses. So you can already see that the Persian Empire making a great deal of progress while Rome is still trying to find its feet. Eventually, Superbus is ousted. Uh, and a republic is inst implemented instead in around 509 BC. There are various different battles in what is loosely called the Wars of Independence for Rome. So we see in the late monarchy and beginning of the Republic, the word king, or in Latin rex, becomes a bit of a dirty word. However, how does this come to be? Because the previous king before King Superbus was Servius Tullius. He was of low birth, and as a result, some of his policies uh, tended towards the plebeians of Rome, Rome the low-status working class. However, Superbus is known to be a particularly tyrannical king. As a seventh king, he is the last king that the Roman civilization had. He is known for his particularly harsh treatment of his predecessor, he supposedly kicks the ageing Servius Tullius down the Senate House steps, whereupon he is set upon by Superbus's henchmen and eventually run over by his daughter Tullia. So here we see various different depictions which recur throughout history. It's one of the favourite topics for Renaissance paintings. Here we see Superbus standing over the frail and weak Servius Tullius, whose throne has now been, whose crown has now been discarded on the staircase. Here we see an etching on the same thing, Superbus standing tall above the steps, towering over the old and weak Servius Tullius. Here we see a more sort of Humpty Dumpty interpretation of it, quite comical in the way that it is staged. We've got some soldiers there uh, beating up the bodyguards of Servius, and Servius taking on a slightly more of a Humpty Dumpty style depiction in this, with his glasses askew on the floor next to him. So, And we, we've got Superbus atop the throne, sitting proudly with his scepter. 
So not only is Superbus famed for his particularly cruel treatment of his predecessor, he's also known for his very lavish building projects, which supposedly had a very detrimental effect on the Roman treasury, such as the temple, temple of Jupiter, Optimus Maximus, Jupiter the Greatest and the Best, which seems to fit with Tarquin Superbus's uh, cognomen, Superbus meaning the proud or the arrogant. Furthermore, we can consider Superbus's reign as particularly dastardly for a number of other reasons. He had been married to Servius Tullius, his predecessor's daughter, but at first he had been married to his older daughter, and Superbus's younger brother Arons had been married to Tullius's younger daughter. Arons and the older Tullius supposedly are very unambitious and a bit meek and mild, which did not fit with their respective spouses' view of what they wanted to achieve. So Superbus and the younger Tullia both bump off their spouses, the older Tullia and Arons, and they eventually get married together. Together they hash this plan to usurp the throne from Tullia's father, Servius Tullius. And some of the scenes that we see through artwork since that point are depict Tullia in a carriage, running over her father's body after he'd been ejected from the Senate House, thrown down the steps and beaten up by henchmen. Here we see a medieval style etching of that scene in particular, and Tullia looking particularly ecstatic, or at least nonplussed, over her father's death and her subsequent running over of his body. However, there may also be some reasons for the ousting of Superbus and his wife, other than the man himself, his wife, or their dastardly crimes. What we've seen since the beginning of the Etruscan kings, that is Priscus up to Servius Tullius, including uh, up to Superbus, including Servius Tullius, is that Rome had gone from an elected monarchy to a dynastic monarchy. Now, with Priscus, we see him taking the throne by sending away Ancus's sons. Ancus is the previous king before Priscus, and in their absence, he gets himself elected. Perhaps if Ancus's sons had been in the city, they might be able to swing the vote their way, since they are the previous king's sons, they have at least some right to the throne. However, they do get their revenge by staging an assassination. They get two shepherds to fake an argument in front of Priscus asking for his advice on how to resolve the dispute. While focused on one of the shepherds, the other one gets a double-sided axe and buries it into Priscus's skull. The reason why this is pertinent in the story is that the next king, Servius Tullius, is not elected either. The wife of Priscus, Tanaquil, deceives the Roman people in saying that Priscus is still alive, all the while manoeuvring her adoptive son, Servius Tullius, onto the throne. Later on, we still see how Superbus has taken his throne totally illegitimately, uh, neither inheriting it nor being chosen to rule by simply killing outright his predecessor Servius Tullius, taking his crown and his throne. Another reason perhaps not specific to Superbus and his dastardly actions for wanting to oust the monarchy is that Around this time in Greece, Solon comes to his archonship and from there he begins implementing a new governmental system, radical and representative democracy. Now, it's very possible that the Romans around this time had some form of contact with Greece and with Athens and are looking enviously at their governmental system and the increasingly self-serving actions of their kings from Priscus, Tullius and Superbus, that it seems like that it's very easy to imagine they become disillusioned with the idea of monarchy and instead want to rule themselves as a democracy instead. Now, I suppose you could say a very real reason to do with Superbus and his family for the ousting of the monarchy, and one that applies to his family themselves. And it could be considered the trigger cause as well. You can consider loads of different long-term causes. Um, however, there is one particular cause that is the straw that breaks the camel's back or the nail in the coffin, however you want to perceive it. And that is the sexual assault of a noble Roman woman called Lucretia, by Superbus's son Sextus, another favourite topic for Renaissance paintings, of which we can see many different copies and many different versions across time. Always with Sextus, a very aggressive body language, looking at Lucretia, Lucretia often unclothed as well to, uh, to show her innocence in the situation, often with Sextus also brandishing a knife threateningly, often with Lucretia often uh, raising her arms in a defensive way. 
This was considered so shocking because Lucretia was a Roman noblewoman. Collatinus, who is his her husband, one day makes a bet with his compatriots. He says, let's all go around and see what our wives are up to. And the one who has the most virtuous wife is the winner. They look around all their wives. Some of them are drinking, gossiping with the slaves. However, Collatinus's wife, Lucretia, the ideal Roman woman, is sat alone with her slaves uh, at the loom, weaving clothing as the ideal Roman woman does. Sextus is so inflamed with lust at Lucretia's virtue that he visits Lucretia under the cover of darkness later that night. He demands that Lucretia sleep with him, and if she does not, he will say that he caught her in the act with a slave and that he murdered them both, as he was legally allowed to by law at the time. Lucretia eventually relents to his demands and his blackmail and will later on take her own life to preserve her honour. Indeed, this story is tragic to many modern observers for a number of reasons. First of all, Lucretia is the perfect and ideal Roman woman. Even by modern standards, she did nothing to deserve this fate, and she is at the whims of a tyrannical ruler and his son. Not only this, but we get a glimpse into the way that Rome, Romans viewed their women and the law surrounding being a husband and being a wife in ancient Rome. The stories go that if a man caught his wife in the act with another man, he was legally allowed to kill both participants with no punishments whatsoever. And again, as modern observers, this does not sit well with our modern sensibilities surrounding gender and human rights. The Lucretia later takes her own life in order to save some scrap of dignity that she might have remaining. And she dies in the presence of her father, Lucretius, and her, cousin, and her husband, Collatinus. The Roman people are suitably incensed by this action of Sextus, and for the first time ever, they get together to vote to take away Superbus's authority. Tullia flees the city of her own accord. Sextus goes to Gabi, which is a city that he helped conquer through the very un-Roman technique of spying and espionage, and is later assassinated. Superbus goes to his kinsmen, the Etruscans, uh, at the city of Veii and Tarquini, and there he grovels for help to retake the throne of Rome. Reluctantly, the Veii and the Tarquini agree because they are of the same kin, the same tribe and the same class, and they think it would be beneficial, both politically and economically, to have an Etruscan king on the throne of Rome. This later precipitates what we would call the Wars of Independence, where Superbus at first allies with the Veii and the Tarquini, and later with the Etruscan king, very powerful Etruscan king, Lars Porsena. So let's conceptualise this and see if we can conclude this episode of the late monarchy to early republic and the ousting of Superbus. You can say there are many causes of these events to happen. They're, they can be sorted loosely into long-term causes and a trigger cause, a straw that broke the camel's back, the last nail in the coffin, similar to the way people might analyse World War I, long-term causes, as well as the trigger cause of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. We can apply the same logic here. So the long-term causes, we can say superbus, mur his murder of his spouse, the older Tullia and the younger Tullia's murder of his younger brother Aaron's. They eventually get married and all the while give the very firm impression that they have no moral qualms with murder to get what they want. So he eventually gets married to the younger Tullia and assault and the murder of Servius Tullius, throwing him down the Senate steps, having his henchmen beat up Servius Tullius, defenseless in the street, and the later running over of Servius Tullius by his daughter in a carriage. Supposedly, that same street on which this happened in Rome today is named the Street of Crime. They also refused to bury Servius Tullius with the traditional Roman rites. Superbus writes this off as saying, well, hang on a second, Romulus uh, ascended into a cloud, and so he was left unburied, therefore it's okay for me to leave Servius Tullius unburied as well. Obviously, a lot of people were not convinced by this logic. He also judged crime without advisers. He essentially made himself the judge, jury and executioner. He ruled without the say-so of the Senate, without asking for advice. And so not only had he put into place a dynastic monarchy, but also an unlimited monarchy as well. 
Furthermore, he murdered senators that were loyal to service, packing the Senate with a bunch of nodding yes-men loyal only to him who would allow him to get away with literal murder. He took the city of Gabi with the help of Sextus as well with the very un-Roman method of spying and espionage. Good Romans faced their enemies in an open battlefield, sword and shield fighting hand to hand. However, what we see is the departure from that tradition with Sextus and Superbus and it's we, we're led to believe that the Romans are very displeased with this method of conquering other cities. Furthermore, we are told that Superbus begins draining the treasury with lavish building projects. There are some stories as well that indicate that he used free-born Roman citizens as slave labour in order to achieve those buildings. The straw that broke the camel's back can only be the rape of the virtuous and perfect Roman woman Lucretia. She did nothing wrong to anybody else, and so this really sticks with us as modern observers. It brings up all sorts of problematic content to do with consent and power and tyranny. So that's the end of the ousting of Superbus and the beginning of the Republic episode. Please tune in for the next one. Thank you very much for watching and listening. <laughs> <laughs>